It's Sunday morning, and we are teaching, trying to teach you the Bible. I put a, something up here on the board, and this is, I passed it out to most of you. He's making some more of them. This is very important to understand. Not that you're going to memorize all of this, but I gave you this page here. And on the top of the page, this is out of Machen's First Year Greek for Beginners. It's important you're not going to memorize all of this, but there's you can use this as kind of like a graph to understand some things about the Bible. When I teach, I teach from the Greek text. Uh, the Greek text is... Well, I got one here somewhere. Here's an, here is a Strong's exhaustive concordance. The Strong's has every word of the Bible. I had a, I had a uh, interlinear Bible here. It's over here somewhere. Maybe somebody took it. Does anybody see my interlinear? I've got an interlinear Bible, and the interlinear Bible is the original Greek text. I don't see it. Must be here somewhere, unless somebody run off with it. No, that's not the interlinear. That's another concordance. The concordance has every word in the Bible listed alphabetically. In order to understand what it is, you, you go to the verse and you look at the number on the side of it, to the right side of it, and it will have a number. If it's an Old Testament verse, it will be in the Hebrew in the back, Hebrew dictionary in the back. You look up that number, it will tell you how to pronounce the word, what it is in the Greek, what it is in the Hebrew. If it's a New Testament word, it will be in the Greek Bible in the back. The New Testament is written in Greek. And you have to know what these words mean because they don't mean exactly what they mean in the English. So, and I put up here the definite article, the. This is a definite article. Now, an article is... An article is a is an adjective. You have three articles in the English. You have the, a, and an. The only definite article in the Greek is the. In fact, the only article in the Greek is the. You do not have indefinite articles in the Greek. You have to go by the context as to whether it's a or and. Now, that's another lesson. The is the only article, and I want you to notice something on the, because I'm going to bring out this point. This, this is the same. There's 24 ways to spell the in the Greek. 24 ways. Why? Because they couldn't translate the properly. When the Bible, when Jesus says in John 14, and the way you know, he used this word, hey. Notice it's feminine. These are masculine, nominative. Uh, excuse me. Uh, neuter gendered. Masculine, feminine, neuter. This is nominative case, genitive case, dative case, accusative case. You see, I don't know what that means. If you remember ninth grade English, you remember it. Nominative case, huh? Nominative case is the subject of the sentence or the predicate nominative. If you remember, Jim is the pastor. The predicate nominative is the same thing in the predicate that equals the subject. It's always going to have a being verb. Being verb. Now, that would, this would be the subject. This would be the predicate nominative. So, you got three ways to spell the in, in the nominative case. Three ways, whether it's masculine, feminine, neuter, gender. 
Why would that matter? When Jesus said, John 14, I am, he said, the way you know. When he said that to the apostles in his last discourse, the is the word hey. It's feminine gender, nominative case. Why would he tell the apostles the feminine way you know? Because he said, I am, and he went on in verse 6 to say, I am the taste. I am the feminine way that's in you. He was talking to his apostles, and they were the nucleus of the church, the wife, the bride of Christ. He said, I am the way that's in you. It's already in your hearts. How are you going to translate that? You can't. It's not even translatable. But if you got this right here and you got an interlinear Bible and you got this, at least you can look at your little the graph. You can look at the little chart for the. So, and you're going to have this all through the Bible. Let me show you something else while I'm at it. You can only, just use this little chart. Don't try to memorize all these. Anytime you see the eta on the end of a word or with an S or with an N, uh, with a tau, eta, or tau, eta, N, it's always feminine gender. You've got that in, right there in your hand. So if you have an interlinear Bible, let me show you something. We're going to be talking about confessing Christ. Confess Christ. Confess Christ does not mean walk down the aisle, let's have 20 verses of just as I am, and you walk down the aisle, stand here and say, I want to confess Christ as my personal Savior. That's not confessing Christ. Confessed is the word homologeo. This is the word in the Greek language, homo, L-O-G-E-O. -E That's the word. It's spelled O-M-O, L-O-G-E-O. -E and there's no H's in the Greek language, but there's a diacritical mark. It has a breathing sound, homo legeo, homo legeo. Homo legato comes to, now you'll recognize this, homo. We say homo, homosexual, other sex. Homogenize, it has to do with other, always. So this is other, excuse me, not other, excuse me, the same, the same. A homosexual is of the same sex. This is of the same logos. Logos is the word word in the Greek. We get our word logo. A logo is something that's represented. It represents, it's something that represents a word. If you've got a bow tie... On the front of a car, what does that say? What does that say? Huh? It says Chevrolet, doesn't it? That's a logo. That's a logo. If you see a check mark, what does that say? Huh? Nike. Nike. Those are logos. Now, this is the way you'll learn these things. Now, we're going to be talking about confessing. The Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, this is Romans 10, 9, and 10, confess with the mouth and believe in the heart. Well, the Bible says, Of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in a man's heart will come out his mouth. What a person believes. If you want to know what somebody believes, Shut your mouth and let them talk for about five minutes, and they'll tell you if money or women or property 
or things are in their heart. You'll find out what they believe. So, and besides that, the law is written upon fleshy tables of our hearts, isn't it? And we will speak about what's in our hearts. The heart was the place of understanding. It doesn't mean the aorta and the right ventricle and the left ventricle and the, and the different valves. It doesn't mean that. It meant the place of understanding. Look over here in Titus 1. If we're going to talk about confessing, look here in Titus 1. Confess means, look, confess means to agree with or be of the same word. If we confess Christ, how often do we do that? Down at the altar one day? No. You do it every day. It's the way you live. Look over here in Titus 1. I love this. Usually, why the translators would translate sometimes the word homologeo, sometimes they'll, they would translate it confess, and sometimes would translate it profess. Well, in this verse, Titus 1, 16, they translate it profess. Now look here, and I'm going through this because we've been talking about Christ Mass. Christmas is Christ Mass. The Mass is eating human flesh. Christmas is Roman Catholicism, whether anybody likes it or not. It is actually Roman Catholic. When you look it up in any dictionary, it'll say Christus, Christus Masse, M-A-E-S-S-E. And the mass is eating human flesh. The Bible says we're not to be keeping these customs of the heathen. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I found a preacher that says I can keep the customs of the heathen. Well, he's disagreeing with God. Chris, I figured out, I didn't figure it out. The Lord showed me how Christmas was paganism when I was 12 years old living in Fort Worth, Texas. I tell the story of how I never saw a TV before. I was 12 years old, 1951. Uh, we heard about a guy down the street got this box in his house that had a picture on it. Never saw one before. So my dad went out and bought an 8-inch screen, rabbit ears, and all we had was CBS and NBC. We watched everything. We were enamored. Boy, just <laughs> golly, wow. A movie in a house. Couldn't get over it. We'd watch Howdy Doody. It's Howdy Doody time. It's Howdy Doody. You remember that? We watched every silly program, and we'd watch the Midnight Mass. And I'm sitting there, 12 years old, skinny little kid. My feet didn't even touch the floor. I remember exactly where I was sitting, and the Pope comes on TV, and I'm sitting there with my little analytical mind. I didn't know that's what I was doing. I had to grow up to find out that's what, that I was analyzing everything. I was saying, is this Christ's Mass? That's the Pope doing the Midnight Mass on Christmas Eve. Is that what this is? And I think St. Nicholas is some name for a Roman Catholic priest or something. I found out later it was a 4th century Roman Catholic bishop. The Mass is, the mass is eating human flesh. I got a, got a book up here with it on, picture on the front of it. I uh, don't see it. I got several thousand books in my library at home. But uh, they raise the Eucharist up. They say, Hacus corpus seum fili. See, it turns into the little body and the blood of Christ. And that you have to be a Roman Catholic to walk down the aisle and to accept the Eucharist. That's where accept Christ comes from. The Methodists brought it out of the Church of England. The Church of England came out of the Catholic Church. They brought it to America in the early 1800s during the during this so-called, uh, these meetings the Methodists would have, and they would build a little fence down front and come down front and try to accept Christ half the night, moaning and groaning and carrying on. It bled over to the Baptist church. To it got into all the other churches. Accept Christ is not the method of salvation. The Bible says so. The natural man, Sukikos, P-S-U-C-H-I-K-O-S, it's our word physical. The physical man, the man of the senses. 
the sensual man, the man that can smell, see, taste, touch, hear, does not receive spiritual things. If you're dead in your sin, have you ever seen anybody dead in a casket accept anything? Have you ever gone into a funeral home after somebody's been dead two days and walk up to the casket and say, you hadn't eaten lately, have you? Brought you a hamburger. Here, hold your hand out. They can't eat. They can't do anything. They're dead. And how dead is dead? Well, it's dead. Dead men do not accept, do not receive decomai spiritual things they do not deck deck is the word 10 in the Greek decade is 10 years and they do not reach out the 10 fingers and accept an offer that's been given that's the word decomai dead men don't accept anything why are you so intent on telling people that because my father was an old country Baptist preacher he would give 20 verses of just as I am and another 15 of Almost Persuaded. And then we would sing another uh, five of Softly and Tenderly. And then Mama would sit there and play the piano while people were going, Oh, God, are we ever going to go home? <laughs> and all that did was bother me. I did not know how to accept Christ because it's not possible when you're dead. What's the method of salvation? Somebody tell me believe that's what Paul told the Philippian jailer in Acts the 16th chapter he came up to Paul and he asked the perennial question what must I do to be saved and Paul said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved but believe is the same thing as confessing how do you get that Jim in the Greek language you have a noun and you have a verb form of the noun. The noun, in this case, is the word faith. Faith is the word P-I-S-T-I-S. -I Pistis. You see that P-I-S-T? That's called the stem of the word. Word endings are changed depending on some character of the word. Believe is the word P -I -S -T -I -S. E U O. There's the stem. This is the verb. This is the noun. If this is the verb, then believe is something you do, isn't it? If you believe something, do you do it? Do you still believe two plus two is four, or have you figured out two plus two is twenty two? Huh? Which is it? Is the square root of nine still three, or is it seven and a half? No, it's still three. So, believe is something you do. Confessing is something you do. It's something you do. Do you work for salvation? No. You work because you are His and you belong to Him. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, not unto, you have different kinds of works. You got ritual. You've got good works. And it's not ritual or something you do to get into heaven. We are his workmanship. Created, workmanship is the word P. O I E M A, poema. Poeo, P it comes from P O I E O, which means to do, has the same meaning as believe is something you do. Has the same meaning as confess is something you do. Not in order to be saved, but because you belong to Him. We're His workmanship. This word workmanship means something that is, poema is like, it's like a mosaic. When God gets through with our lives, we are his mosaic. We're his tapestry. The common word do or toil is the word ergon. Ergon. Uh, you can put the E in. In ergon is our word energy. Energy. 
Ergon is the common word toil. That's not this word poeo. This means a mosaic, something that God's creating. We're created in Christ Jesus unto agathos. Agathos works. I gave you this thing with the on it. Right under the is the word agathos. There are 27 ways to spell agathos in the Greek language. Whew. You can't learn all of them. You just look them up. People say, how do you learn all this stuff? One word at a time. I just look at it one word. So the vocative case down there means a direct address. Good. You direct you you say something directly to somebody. Good. That's good. So that's and this word down here, mikros, we think of microbe is something small. You got twenty seven ways to smell to spell small in the Greek. I'll get off of that. Now so agathos means beneficial. Beneficial. Agathos means what benefits us. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are his workmanship, his mosaic. What does this have to do with God? Well, Philippians 2.13 says, It is God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. God does what he wants to do in his people. He whips us and beats us and scourges us so we can partake of his holiness, hagiosmos, H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S. That's the word holiness. Holy is the word hagios. It comes from this word. Hagiosmos is a form of hagios. In fact, the word hallowed, Hallowed and sanctify are the word hagiazo, H A G I A Z O. When we say, Hallowed be thy name, we're saying, Lord, make your name, your onoma, holy in my life. Name onoma means authority. What is God's authority? His law. We're saved by a working faith. Wilt thou know, vain man, that faith without works is dead? I keep saying this. You can say, I went out and bought a car. I went out and bought this car. And a uh, real nice car. It's got a real nice interior. Everything's great. You go open the hood and it has no motor in it. You didn't buy a car. You bought a shell. <laughs> you got to have a motor. And the Bible says faith, over there in Galatians 5, faith works by love. Faith works by love, but you got to know what love is, don't you? You got two words that have been translated into the word love. I'm trying to get back to Christmas. I'm having a hard time getting to it. All right, love. Now, this is going to be the same thing as confessing. It's going to be the same thing as believing, because believing is doing, isn't it? It's a verb. It's going to be the same thing as confess, because that's something you do. I better read this about confess before we go any further. Go to Titus 1. Titus 1. Now, in Titus 1, the translators translated the word profess in this verse from homo legeo. Same word as confess. Same word. So, Titus 1, verse 16. Titus 1, 16. He's talking about, well, let's read 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. And even their mind and conscience is defiled, they profess that they know God with their mouth. That word profess is the word homo legao. Same word. They profess with their lips. This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Isaiah said and repeated that in Matthew 15. They profess that they know God, but what 
they do in works they deny him their belief is wrong their confessing is wrong what they do is not right if you don't do what God says what does that make you huh what does it make you somebody tell me Well, it makes you a liar, but it makes you what? What did you say? Heartless. It makes you an antichrist, doesn't it? Doesn't it what it makes you? They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being, an ab being abominable, the legma, B-D-E-L-U-G-M-A. Stinking, you stink in God's nostrils just because you say with your lips you love God, and you won't do what he says? What do you mean doing what he says? What do you mean? Well, everywhere that Jesus or the Bible has an imperative mood in the Greek. An imperative mood is something you learn in about the seventh grade. Does anybody remember imperatives? You remember your English class in about the seventh grade, and the teacher said you got four kinds of sentences. You got a statement or a declarative, ends in a period, in a period, and then you got a. I learned this from, I think, Mrs. Johnson in the fifth grade, I think, one of those people. And then you got an, an interrogative. An interrogative, which is ends in a question mark. Jim went to the store. Did Jim go to the store? Then you have an exclamatory. And that ends in an exclamation mark. Jim went to the store, and I didn't even tell him to. Didn't even ask him. Exclamation point. And then there's, then there's an imperative. And this is the same in the Greek. The same thing. Command. I would tell Eric when he was at home, take the garbage out. I wasn't inviting him. I didn't say, Eric, I'd like for you to take the garbage out. Would you please take it just as I am? Come on, Eric. Won't you come? No, no, no. He'd say, I'll do it later. I'd say, you'll do it now. <laughs> now, he has to tell me what to do. He's too old. It's an imperative command. Everywhere you have an imperative is the commandment of God. You'll be confessing it. Yeah, I, Jim, I can't do all of it. I know you can't. But you'll be wrestling with your sin in your life. When he says, strive to enter into the straight gate, one of my favorite imperatives, A-G-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Agonizomize our word agonize. That is not a choice. If you are a believer, that is a command. You say, I can't do that right now. I can't agonize over my sin. If you belong to God, you will somewhere along the way. God will beat you till you learn to. And when he says, humble yourself under the hand of God. Humble. T A P E I N O O. Level self. But who do you level to? Humble don't mean to walk around, kind of knock kneed with your pigeon toe together like, I'm humble. <laughs> That's not humble. Humble is to God only. If you're humble to God, you'll be bold to men, and people will call you crazy. You'll say Christmas is pagan, Easter's pagan, Easter is Ishtar. I don't have time to go through all of it. And God doesn't love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born. They'll say, I don't believe that. That's because you're insane. America's insane. Did y'all know that? They're crazy. When you look up insane in Webster Dictionary, right down here, right there, insane says, 
the inability to think rational. I'll give people Greek words and definitions. Is that your opinion? No, you're insane. You can't think right. You tell people tongues is dialectos and glossa. Well, I know what I did, Shonda Lakanda Lamondi Shondi. That's foolish. Has nothing to do with that. You can tell people, the Bible says, don't keep the customs of the heathen, and everything that goes on at Christmas time is the customs of the heathen. Everything. And they'll say, well, I can do it as long as I do it in the name of Jesus. Jesus doesn't want his name on an ancient orgy. That orgy that went from the 17th of December up to the 24th of December, that was an orgy in the ancient world that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ's Mass. Now, I'm not going to do it. You can get big famous preachers to tell you it's okay. I have a real deep abiding conviction about making God happy with my life. Now, look here in Titus. He said, some men profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Look over here in 1 John. So if you want, huh? Did I not read it? Oh, yeah, I need to finish reading it. Excuse me. Some men profess they know God, but in works they deny Him, being an abominable and disobedient. Notice you're disobedient if you're not doing what you say. Being disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. What's that word, reprobate? Somebody tell me. Huh? Adokimos. Is that what you said? Adokimos comes from dokime or dokimazo. Dokimazo means to be tried or tested in a fire. When you place the alpha in front of a word as a negative particle, and that's the way it's tra that's the way this word is translated, it negates the word. It means no fire. <coughs> Reprobate silver was a type of silver in the Old Testament that they did not <coughs> put in the fire, and they threw it out because they didn't feel like it had enough ore in it, and it was worthless. You're, if you're not tried in the fire, you're reprobate. And that's why you're disobedient to God. Look over here in 1 John. Look in 1 John. 1 John. First John 2. What we do is what we believe. Jesus said to Nicodemus, He that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they're wrought in God. He that doeth truth. What, how do you do the truth? Well, you'll be agonizing. You'll be humbling. You'll be adding to your faith. Add to faith. And it names seven things in first in Second Peter 1 and 5. 1 and 5. Add is the word. Doesn't look like it, but in the Greek it's E-P-I-C-H-O-R-E-G-E-O. -E -E Epicoregio. Epi is a prefix. It means to superimpose upon your life the koros, which means a circular dance, ago. A choreographer is one who teaches a dance. And we have a dance to dance, and he names seven things. And the first thing he says is virtue. Arete. Arete means to be mature and grow up. How long does it take you to do that? A long time. But epicoregeo is an imperative mood. This is not your choice. You will add these seven things to your life. 
And it'll happen over 20, 30, 40 years of your life that you'll add to your life. And that'll be your doing. That'll be your doing. Look here in 1 John. If you don't do what God says, what are you? If you're contradicting Him, it'll tell you right here. 1 John. I'll read verse 20. Well, let me read 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. We've had a lot of people come here. They couldn't handle this message. Daily cross, death to self, self-denial is hard to handle, isn't it? When you first start, after you learn enough of these words and learn enough of the Bible, when you go out in public, when I go out in public, I walk into a grocery store, I feel like, I feel like a calculus teacher from college walking into a, a room full of kindergartners because nobody knows anything. Preachers don't know nothing. They don't know these words. If you think the preachers know these words I'm putting on the board, they don't. I speak 61 years learning these things, and I know they don't know them. I never hear them say any of it. The Baptist I was raised around, if you say obey God, they say, you're talking about salvation by works. No, I'm talking about salvation that works in you. It's God that works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. If you belong to God, He has to be working in you. You have to be changing a little at a time. In fact, the word repent has the same meaning as homologeo and believe. Because believe is doing. Repent, metanoia, means to be turned and think different than you used to think. Has anybody's thinking changed besides me? You mean you used to think different? I used to want to be rich. That's what I lived for in my 40s in real estate. I was going to go out there and buy 50 houses in this town. And I knew how to make deals. God wouldn't let me do that. He kept making me sick. God will make you sick. Therefore will I make thee sick and smiting thee because of thy sins, Jim Brown. As well as Micah 6, 13. God's not going to let us do what the world does. You're not going to do that. So, repent means to be turned and think differently. Why do you have to be turned? Because you, you can't turn yourself. There's none, that see There's none that seeketh after God. Nobody. You can have this sincere feeling, but the Bible says love... Love is not hypocritical. Love does not dissemble. It is not anupocrites. Anupocrites. Love is A N U P O K R I T E S. It comes from Hippocrates, H-U-P-O-K-R-I-T-E-S. Hippocrates is our word hypocrite. A hypocrite was an actor in the first century under an assumed character. He went on the stage and wore a mask. He pretended. Placing the alpha in front of Hippocrates negates the word without hypocrisy. Agape is without hypocrisy. And that word love... He had two words translated into the English word love. Two words. And love is going to be the same thing as repent. It's going to be the same thing as confess. It's going to be the same thing as believe. Love. Believe is doing, isn't it? It's a verb. And confess is doing. Some men profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. And agape is also doing. There's two words that have been translated 
into the English language, L-O-V-E. And what is the word agape? And you have the verb form, A-G-A-P-E-O, the word ending change, depending on some character of the word. And you have the word phileo. Now, phileo, when the Bible says God is love, love your neighbor, love your enemy, it is never phileo. Never. That just means to like or have an affection for. Like, affection. You can like your dog. You can like to get drunk. You can like drugs. You can like your car. You can like to go to the movie. You can like the beach. You can like anything. But agape has to do with relationship with kings to their subjects, to subjects <coughs> and fathers to their family. And the Bible says the best definition for agape is Second John 6. This is love. This is agape. How have I put it? Let me make it an equation, okay? Let me put it this way. Agape equals walking after the commandments of God. That's what Second John 6 says. So walking after his commandments is going to be confessing. That's going to be doing. I've had people say, you're talking, you're talking legalism. You bet your life I am. God's word is legal. If you belong to him, he's birthed you by his will, not by yours. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And he's predestined us to conform to Christ's likeness. For whom he did foreknow. He had a people, a home. He had a whom he did foreknow. And the whom's that he foreknew, prognosco, P-R-O, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. We got our word prognosis from that. It means to know intimately ahead of time. Those that he knew ahead of time, he has predestined that we will conform <laughs> to the likeness of Christ. Was Christ obedient? Did Christ do the will of the Father? He said, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. You say, Jim, this sounds like a hard message. Do I have to change? You have to change continually. This word repent, you'll find over there in Jeremiah. Since you cannot turn yourself, 31, 18. The Bible says 31, 18 and 19. Lord, turn thou me and I shall be turned. And after I was turned, I was ashamed of myself for the way I've lived. And I repented. And I took the blame. You're not repentant unless you do those things in Jeremiah 31, 18. Am I ashamed of the way I've lived? Yes. I've lived as bad as anybody here. I used to be a gospel singer, which is the worst thing I did, and a pop singer. I traveled all over the country and sang in big venues. And I was a foolish, foolish man. God's made me ashamed of that. You have to be ashamed of the way you've lived. I would ask everybody to raise your hand, but I'm afraid some of you wouldn't raise your hand and you'd be lying. <laughs> you lie if you say, I'm not ashamed of the way I've lived. Because there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And I'm a man, and God has dealt with my heart to own up to my sin in my life. Nobody here has been in more sin than I've been in. No one. I don't care what you've done. God had to deal. The reason I'm preaching the message as hard as I'm preaching it is because of the way I've lived and the way God has beaten the living tar out of me. Stuck me in my deathbed in the hospital several times till I finally said, Lord, I give up. I surrender. I'm going to start preaching to everybody and tell everybody the truth. And I'm going to start with these doctors and nurses. And I did. And I was about in my mid-40s. Now, Look here in First John. If you don't do what God says, I'll get back to Christmas here in a minute. If you don't do what God says, 
He says here, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out. They left grace and truth that they might be made manifest. They want to be seen and heard that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Unction. Well, that sounds like a funny word, doesn't it? Well, it's not. It's the same word as anoint. C-H-R-E-S-T-O-S. Christos is the word anoint, or krea. Krea. Or creo, different ways to spell it. And you have anointing, you have a... What is anointing? Well, you'll find out what anoint is when we get down to verse 27. Let's keep reading. You have an anointing of the Holy One, and you know all things. There's a reason you know all things, because you know the truth. I have not written unto you, because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Denieth is the word a R N E O M A I means to contradict. Now, if God says something, the best thing you can do, if I say Christmas is pagan, if I say Christmas is pagan, don't say, I don't think it is. Say, well, even if it is, I like to do it. Just go ahead and say that, and I'll accept that. But don't tell me it's not pagan because it is. It's an absolute historical fact that it's paganism. Christmas didn't have anything to do with Jesus. Jesus was God in the flesh. He died to save sinners. <coughs> but December the 25th was the birthday of the sun. God's in the ancient world. When the sun would wane. I'm going to race this up here. When the sun would wane down to the winter solstice, the longest days of the year is June the 21st. And then the sun gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because we are going around the sun, the earth is, and it's on its act and it's tilted at 26 degrees. And when we get over here, it's winter, and get over here, it's summer leaning toward the sun in the northern hemisphere. Well, the sun going around this, it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer till you get to the winter solstice, December the 21st, the longest nights of the year. And the pagans said, the sun's burning out. We need to do something. So they had a festival from the 24th of December until the, not 24th, from the 17th through the 24th, 17th through 24th. And then the sun would begin to get brighter again. And they said, we got to have a festival. So they had the Feast of Saturn or the Saturnalia. And I keep saying this. Did you know that America's only been celebrating Christmas for about 120 years? That's it. You will, I, I challenge you, if you can find a picture of George Washington around a Christmas tree, I'll give you a $100 bill. They didn't do it back then. They didn't even do it in 1865 when Lincoln was assassinated. They didn't do it back then. Now, you can paint a picture, but it won't be a real picture. They didn't do it. It was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. Constantine brought this into the church in 325 A.D., at the Nicene Council and started Christmas, Pope Julius the first gave Christ's Mass its pagan name. I, what do you think I'm making this up? I'm really good if I'm making this up, if I'm making it all up. Especially if I tell you that you can either agree with this or you can call it a lie. Whatever you want to do, I'm just giving you the information. When Constantine was head of the empire, he was lord and master of the eastern and western empire. 
He started here at Constantinople, then he came over here at the Malvian Bridge, crossed it, going into Rome, and said he saw a cross in the sky and said, now this is so stupid. He said, the Lord said, I heard a voice that go conquer by this sign. Conquer by the sign of the cross and go out there and put it on the shields of the crusaders and kill people in the name of Jesus? Jesus said, if my kingdom of the, were of this world, then would my servants fight? It's not of this world. I don't believe in fighting ever. The servant of the Lord does not strive. The Bible says over there in 1 Timothy, servant of the Lord does not makomai, M-A-C-H-O-M-A-I. We got our word macho from that. It means to fight. God's people do not fight in this world. And we're not supposed to be doing that. What was I? Now I'm going to make up something. Boy, if I'm making this up, I'm really good. <laughs> Constantine was afraid of losing the Roman Empire to all of these wild, crazy barbarians. If you saw the barbarian series, they'll tell you all about it. These barbarians were the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Franks, the Angles, the Saxons, the Celts, the Gauls, the Huns. And they were rampaging across this European continent. Constantine was afraid of them, said they're going to overrun us. So he said, we'll amalgamate their sun and tree gods with this apostate church at Rome. And that's how the Roman Catholic Church started. They brought Christ's Mass into the church. Christmas didn't hit any calendar until 354 A.D., 354 years after Jesus. That's when it hit a calendar. Let me get on with this here. Let me finish this. Now, who is a liar but he that denieth or contradicts that Jesus is the Christ? He is anti-Christ. You're not the anti-Christ, but you are anti-Christ. Anti is a Greek word. It means instead of or in opposition to. You are in opposition to Christ if you contradict Christ. You're anti-Christ. It's bet you're better off to say, I like to drink and get drunk, than to say, I don't think there's anything wrong with drinking. What you're doing is contradicting God. First of all, we're to abstain from all appearances of evil. Does it appear evil in America to be a drinker? Yes. Does it appear evil to be a cusser? Yes. Do you need to clean up your mouth? Yes. I'm not going to ask how many of you use hell or damn once in a while. She didn't stop that. Keep coming here and I'll keep saying it till you'll be ashamed to keep doing it. Okay. Now. These people finally overthrew Rome. During the. During the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church was killing people all over the European continent. They had families they were slaughtering. Now, I must have made these people up. I guess that's what people think. They were slaughtering the Albigens family. The Albigens family, the Cathars, the Waldens family, the Huguenots, And these were people that taught and believed predestination, and they did not believe, along with many other families, and they did not believe in Roman Catholicism. The Roman Catholics had something called the Inquisition. We get the word inquisitor from that. They sent out these, these inquisitors to towns, and if you would not partake of the sacrament of the Mass... They would torture you and murder you, and they did the most diabolical ways of killing people, ripping their skin off. Some of it is so horrible and terrible. They cut one man's belly open, 
fill it full of corn and turn the pigs in on him. They would cut a woman's breast off, cut her legs off, cut her arms off, and set her out in the middle of a field and let her expire. This is the kind of thing they did. And these families said this was over a 700-year period. They killed 60 million Jews and Christians. The Roman Catholic Church did. And you can get all of this out of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Just order Fox's Book of Martyrs and read it. You can't hardly get through it without nearly throwing up reading what the Roman Catholic Church did to these people. So they said, we'll go to this new land called America, and we will outlaw any papal influences. They outlawed Roman Catholicism. They outlawed Christmas. You could spend a couple of days in jail and pay a fine if you tried to celebrate Christmas. While the Puritans were here, they said, we'll call ourselves Puritans because we'll purify this land of all Roman Catholic influences, and they outlawed it in America. Now, that's the truth. Deal with it if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want to. I want to deal with it. I want to do right. I want to confess Christ. Now, look here. Then he says, He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. When you confess Christ, what is it you do? You confess, you tell the truth, don't you? Look up there in verse 27. But the anointing, which is the same word, basic word, is unction back down there in verse 20. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth. The anointing is truth. Well, what's the truth? It's got a definition. A-L-E. T-H-E-I-A. That's the word truth every time you find it in the Greek dictionary. That's it. It's a construction of the word lanthano. Lanthano means to hide, lie hid, conceal, And the alpha in front of a word as a negative particle, every time you find truth, every time you find the word truth and you go into your, your concordance, it'll say, it'll say, from, from A as a neg part. From the alpha as a negative particle, and it'll say, and you put it in front of lanthano, it means not to hide anything. That's what I'm doing with you up here. I'm not hiding anything from you. I'm telling you what things mean, and you can tell people what things mean. So that's your opinion. I think I can do Christmas, and I get by with it, and God won't mind. He won't. But everybody else is doing it. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Christmas is evil. Besides wasting all that money, I've said it before. From 1990 until the 1991 to the year 2000, America spent right at $10 billion on live Christmas trees. Just live Christmas trees, nothing else. Forget the baubles and the bangles and the hangings. They spent $7 billion on imported hangings here just a couple of years ago. Could we have found something better to do with that than sticking a tree in our <coughs> den and then letting it sit there for three or four weeks and then taking it out by the garbage dump? And letting the garbage man carry that dead God out here. What do you mean a dead God? Venus was always worshipped in the form of a cone. Venus de Milo is a modern version. Venus was always worshipped this way. Form of a cone. Mr. Layard in Layard's Nineveh 
1849 was his digs brought up and published. He said they always put a star on top of them because that was, they were worshipped in the stars. And Jeremiah 10 says they put a platform because they cannot go. They have to be born. They have to be carried. Huh? They decorate it. In fact, let's look at that. Jeremiah 10. I don't look at this very often. Now, people think I make this stuff up. I don't make it up. It's just there. Do with it what you want. Now, chapter 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word, O Lord. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord. Learn not the way of the heathen. He's not saying here, don't worship their gods. He says, don't learn their way. The word way is the word in the Hebrew is the word derek. It equals or has the same meaning in the New Testament as hodos. The Bible, that is the word way, road, journey. The Bible says narrow is the way that leads to life and few will find the narrow way. The word narrow, thelebo, is the verb form of the word thelipsis. And thelipsis is the word tribulation every time you find it in the New Testament. Every time you find tribulation. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. That was said when Paul was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. When they stoned somebody, they didn't throw rocks at him. It's not the way they stoned somebody. They would take him to a high precipice, throw him off, maybe 20 feet high. If they could find something higher, they would. If you didn't break your neck, break your back, they would take these great big boulders and throw them down on you. And when Paul was stoned at Lystra, he said, we must do much tribulation and enter the kingdom of God. This is what people want to do you when you tell the truth. When you tell them predestination is true, God does not love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before they were born. And Christmas is pagan. What's wrong, Jim? Why are people not saying these things? We are in the apostasy. The day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first. We're in it. Preachers don't tell the truth. If they did, they'd define these words. Falling away, apostasis. It means, apo means a removal. And stasis means to stand upright. One who was said to be standing upright was said to be bearing his staros, which comes from the word stasis, and that is the word cross. He was said to be bearing his cross. Well, you have to bear a cross so you can't go to heaven when you die. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. He said, only few will find the narrow way. Narrow is the way that leads to life. It's a tribulation way. You can't go to heaven because you believe in some sort of a Jesus. That's not good enough. You have to obey what the Jesus of the Bible says, and that's only few. Most people, when they die, are going to hell. That's what the Bible says. Few will find the narrow way. Many are going to the broad way that leads to destruction. Not many people are going to heaven when they die. Well, that sounds like your opinion. Well, it's not. Jesus said only few are going. Few will find this narrow tribulation way. Look over here in 1 Peter. Or oh, let me read this, and I'll go to 1 Peter. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. He didn't say worship in their gods is vain. He said the customs are vain. Well, I think we can do it as long as we do it for Jesus. Do you actually believe Jesus wants his name on an ancient orgy? It was an orgy for seven days. They elected a man to be the head of the Saturnalia. And at the end of the Feast of Saturn, he had to die. 
He got to have all the sex, all the food, everything he wanted all week long. And then he died. You think Jesus wants his name on that? No, no, no. I've got a, I've got a paper I read every year. I've read it once, I think. This is something I wrote. I'm going to read it again. I read it one week. And I titled this, Jesus, You Wouldn't Mind. This is a direct prayer to Jesus. Jesus, I know you told us the customs of the heathen are vain and not to learn the way of the heathen. And I know that you told us that philosophy, which is an affection for man's wisdom, and vain deceit and traditions of men will spoil us and lead us into captivity if we follow these traditions. Jesus, I realize you told us not to add or diminish from your word in Deuteronomy 4, 12, and 18. I know you said that, Jesus. And I know you said that your word is pure in Proverbs 30 and 5 and in 17 and 27. And Jesus, I understand you said your word is unchangeable in Malachi 3, 6. But you won't mind if we keep a custom keep a drunken festival in your honor as long as we change the name so it sounds kind of Christian. Even if it is fire worship, you won't mind, will you, Jesus? Now, Jesus, we're not going to be able to stop the drunks and the pagan worshipers from continuing to keep their ancient customs. There will be a record number of suicides this time of the year, and the poor will feel oppressed. But we'll take a dinner to them at Christmas time and tell them, we'll be back next year. Hope you can make that last all year long. And Jesus, there'll be a record number of wrecks from drunk drivers. And the liquor stores will be thrilled to see the season come. And Jesus, Playboy magazine puts out a special Christmas edition. Doesn't that make you happy? Adultery will run rampant as husbands and wives abandon their vows at parties. And you'll be real happy when you hear my idea, Jesus. We're gonna, we've gone back in history and found the fire worshippers of the ancient world who had a festival that started on December the 17th till December the 25th. The birthday of their fire god, Hercules or Mithra. And they worship pagan gods. Jesus, here's my idea. We're going to take this drunken festival and call the Feast of Saturn or the Saturnalia, and we're going to put your name on it. And we'll call it Christ Mass. But we'll drop an S to disguise it, okay? They offered their children in the fire and ate them. But I assure you, Jesus, that even though most of the world will be celebrating this festival the same way they've done thousands of years before you were born, I want you to believe me when I tell you we won't do it that way. And when they ask us why we're dragging the church into doing something so evil, I'll tell them, we don't do it that way. We're using paganism to glorify God. Jesus, doesn't that make you happy? You don't mind, do you? After all, preachers say it's okay as long as you use pagan festival to spread the gospel. I have never seen anybody open up a Christmas present and say, thank the Lord for Jesus' death on the cross and for dying for me, a lost sinner. Never seen that in my life. I've never seen anybody open up a present and say, let's take this to somebody that's poor and needy instead of me. I've got plenty. Have you? You won't mind, will you? I promise, Jesus, we're going to keep the customs of the heathen like... We're not going to keep the customs of the heathen the way they kept them. We're going to keep them different. You won't mind if we do this, will you, Jesus? What do you think? You say, Jim, you're the only guy I know of that's preaching this this hard. I know that. God's convicted my heart. I'm not playing games with Billy Graham, with Charles Stanley, with any of those guys... They're the boringest, 
people I've ever listened to. If going to church bores you, I understand why you don't go. I wouldn't go either. If I couldn't come here and preach here and fellowship with these people in truth, I wouldn't go anywhere. I don't hear anybody saying anything. Now, look over one of my favorite verses. I didn't finish it, have I? <laughs> All right. The customs of the people are vain. One cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They cut it down. They deck it with silver and with gold. The garlands. That actually is paganism in the ancient world. Next time you see a Christmas tree, just walk up to it and say, Good morning, Venus. Have you seen Hercules lately? How you doing? Because that's who it is. It is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. In the pagan world, they said the tree was the giver of all divine gifts to men. That's where the gifts under the tree comes from. And what that is, is all that's in the world, all, John said, all in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And Eve saw a tree that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. It would make her wise, and she could be proud of herself. That's all that's in the world. That's distributing fortunes. The word demon, demonion, means to distribute fortunes. It's distributing all that's in the world. It is it's the exact opposite of spiritual things. I gave the verse last week, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Men hate the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is for crucifying self daily. And you don't do that. People do that to you when you tell them the truth. You really want to make enemies, and you have to make enemies to be a believer. Friendship with the world is enmity against God, and whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Popular people are God's enemy. You can't take a stand for Christ and be friends with everybody. You just can't. If you're friends with the world, you're at enmity with God. Enmity is the word ekthra, E-C-H-T-H-R-A. It means hostile. If you get along with everybody, you're hostile to God. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Who does the world speak well of? Give me some names. Huh? Joel Osteen. How about Tom Brady? Huh? Greatest quarterback that's ever lived. Looks like a movie star. He's got a wife that looks like a movie star. He makes $50 million on his contract or $100 million on his contract. Won five Super Bowls and nobody else has ever done that. Not even Joe Montana. Not even Terry Bradshaw. And they are popular. He's got one major flaw. Tom Brady does. He's a Roman Catholic. He believes if he eats the body of Jesus, he gets to go to heaven. He's handsome. He is the winner of the world. Wouldn't trust him as far as I could pick him up and throw him. Too many people like him. Who else would be? Donald Trump is popular. He got the vote. You'd actually be somebody that's a billionaire and never cheated anybody. You actually believe that? Well, better than having Hillary Clinton. They're both made out of the same fabric. Don't you know that? Both out of the same mold. I don't believe in, I don't believe in politicians. I don't vote for them. I quit years ago. They bring out a king cobra, and they bring out a black mamba and say, "Which one do you want to sleep with? This one's a Republican and this one's a Democrat. Neither one. Thank you." <laughs> Whoever come up with the idea, there's only two people that, the truth is on the other side of the universe. The truth is where you take the cover off. They deck it with silver and gold. They fashion it with nails and hammers that it move not. 
They are upright as the palm tree and speak not. They cannot, they must needs be born because they cannot go. Being not afraid of these tree goddesses, they cannot do evil. Man. Huh? I just finished this point. Okay. <laughs> Neither is any of them to do good. They can't do good. I like verse 8. They are altogether brutish and foolish. Brutish is the word ba'ar. It means they have the understanding of a natural brute beast. They are stupid. The word means stupid, dull of hearing. They have got nothing. Now, if you don't agree with God about keeping the custom of the heathen. How many DVDs do I have on Christmas? Four or five hundred. If you want it in great detail, I've got all kinds of details on. In fact, I gave you this right here. How, many, how much time do I have, Mike? 18. Fifteen. I gave you this. This is all the king's that slaughtered Israel for 500 years. For 500 years, Israel was a nation under kings. 500 years under kings. From the first king, Saul, actually the first king was God. They said, we don't, you being our king, give us a man king. So God gave him Saul. And from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, through 2 Chronicles, Israel kept going after the sun and the tree god, the sun, which was Baal, and the grove, which was the tree goddess, and always represented by the moon upon the earth, by the moon, and I got much to say about that. And God says, if you go after these other gods, I'll scatter you all over the face of the earth. Well, did they go after them? For 500 years, they went after these gods. They never kept their sabbatical years where they're supposed to let the land lie fallow in order to be able to have the crops that they had, and they just burned the ground up, sucking all the nutrients out of the ground. God says, I'm going to scatter you, and God scattered them for 2,600 years until June 5th through June 10th, 1967, when they threw out the Jordanians and possessed Jerusalem for the first time in 2,600 years. What's going on in the Middle East has to do with what Israel is doing for 500 years, going after these tree gods. And that's a fight over there, over the land. And that's the truth. We have to be close to the end of time. We're in the apostasy. We've fallen away from the truth. The day of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first. And it's here. The falling away can be proven by these preachers in these pulpits in America. They know nothing about God's Word. Billy Graham puts his approval on accept Christ. He puts his approval on men who don't even believe in the deity of Christ. He doesn't say the right things about salvation. It's belief. Belief is doing. It's not salvation by works. It's salvation that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Well, I've given you this. This gives you all the Assyrian kings. And Assyria overthrows northern Israel in 722 B.C. And this piece of paper will give you the kings that come in, Tiglath Pileser, I always like that name. Name your king, name one of your kids, Tiglath Pileser. Tiglath Pileser the third in seven he reigned from seven forty seven to seven twenty seven. And for ten years the Assyrians were attacking Israel because they God had them attack Israel because they went after all these gods and they finally carried them away. And you'll see that in Second Kings, where it says Shalmaneser the fifth Sargon, it'll show Second Kings seventeen and three. Seventeenth chapter of Second Kings tells about the Assyrians coming away, coming in and carrying northern Israel away. And then eighteen and nine, eighteen and nine, that tells you all about how that 
uh, Shalmaneser and Sennacherib came down to try to slaughter Israel, southern Judah, while they were carrying northern Israel away. And then if you go down here into Babylon, Babylon carried southern Judah away in 2 Kings 24, 25. 24 and 25, it'll tell you the whole story. In Jeremiah 21, it'll tell you all about it. That's when they carried Israel, northern Israel, and southern Judah away in 7, in 586 B.C. And these are the kings that did it, right there. And it'll give you the places to read about them. I've got this in one of my books, and I thought, well, I'll just bring a copy and give everybody a copy. <laughs> God scattered, you know what amazes me? That everybody knows that Israel was in bondage for 400 years. But nobody knows that when they were scattered, they were scattered and lived under all of these empires and all these people that overthrew them for 2,600 years. And they didn't come out of it until May 14th, 1948, when they were declared a nation for the first time in 2,600 years. What do you think's going on over there in Israel right now? What do you think's happening? What's happening is the end of time is on the way. We're getting close. The apostasy's here. The preachers don't tell the truth. They lie. <laughs> the method of salvation is belief, not accept Christ and not a sinner's prayer. How many of you have heard that the sinner's prayer is how you get into heaven? Yes. That ain't it. That ain't it. The Bible says the blind man that was healed in John 9, verse 31. He said, We know that God heareth not sinners. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. You've got to be worshiping God and doing the will of God for him to even listen to you. And every preacher will go to Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's true, but that's not the method of salvation. Read the next verse. How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How are you going to pray to a God you don't believe in? Believe me, I'm not going to pray to Jupiter any minute here. I don't believe he's there. Don't believe in him. I'm not going to pray to Zeus or pray to one of these gods. I don't believe in them. The God I pray to is the one I believe in. He's the one I obey. He's the one. You say, Jim, I can't do all this all at once. I know you can. But you can be wrestling. If I ask how many of you here wrestle with sin and doing what you need to be doing, how many of you wrestle with that? Nearly every hand going up. <laughs> Guess what? So do I. Sometimes I say, did I say the right thing? I'll be walking into Publix or Kroger's. I'll say, Lord, I've talked to everybody in here, giving them DVDs. Is there something I haven't said? Maybe I could be gentler, Lord. But I've been trying to be gentle. I used to be hard on them. Lord, help me. Help me to say the right thing. Help me to be able to reach somebody for you. There's a verse over here that I love. On the way back, let's stop at Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Here's what Israel did. Isaiah 40. It's talking about a man that's wanting to come to his God, which is a tree God. Verse 20, he that is so impoverished that he hath no offering for God, no oblation, he chooses a tree that will not rot. Now, what is that? That's an evergreen, isn't it? In the pagan countries up in Norway, they would take the holly. They said these fir trees were magical trees. They could live in 50, 60, 80 below zero, so they, so they took these fir trees, hung these, this holly and greenery around their pagan temple, and they had a wassailing bowl song. 
what the wassailing bowl was where they would gather together around and drink this elixir and get drunk. And they would sing this famous wassailing bowl song, duck the holes with boughs of holly, fa la 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 That's a pagan song. Ridiculous, isn't it? I saw they had a commercial on TV a couple years ago, a Christmas commercial. They were selling something, and they sh and they had these couples out on this dance floor, and they were dancing to joy to the world, the Lord is come. I thought, what blasphemy! Dancing to that. God deliver us from. Verse 28 of that, hast thou, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, nor neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. I want to bow to God's will. Look over here in Deuteronomy. Look in Deuteronomy 12. People say, well, we can do this as long as we do it for God. What you are is Antichrist when you say that. If he says this in Deuteronomy 12, don't say, well, we've changed, we changed things, and we can do it as long as we do it for God. He says, you cannot. He says, the customs will lead you astray. Does the customs make you overcharge and overspend and and mess with the kin folks that drink and you don't drink and they're drinking and and does it make you have to go to a family gathering where you give somebody gifts and they give you a gift and you say we spent two hundred dollars on a gift for them they only spent twenty five on us <laughs> now how now how Christian is that huh I love this Deuteronomy twelve. Deuteronomy is right before they go into the promised land. Right before they cross the border. And God is warning Israel. He's killed off all the unbelievers out there for 40 years. Deuteronomy is where they're all believers. When Verse 29, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them. You're going in there, Joshua, and you're going to lead these people in there. When you go in to possess the land, they're all pagans there. The Hittites, the Perizzites, the, Ab the Jebusites, all these ites are there. And dwell, they dwell in the land. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. After that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, I don't want you to say these words. How did these nations serve their gods? What was their rituals? What did they do? I don't want you finding out how they did it, much less doing it. Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. You're committing this atrocity against God when he said, don't do it. For every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. And then they ate their sons and their daughters, Jeremiah 19 says. In 2 Kings the 6th chapter said they ate their children. God says, you want to act like this? I'll make you eat your children. How did he do that? He said, I'll set all your enemies against you. And they'll lay siege against your cities. I'll send the Syrians in. All your enemies, they'll block off all pathways to any food, and you'll sit there, and your kids will start dying, and you'll start eating them. Just read the 19th chapter of Jeremiah. Read the 30th chapter, the very end of the chapter of Isaiah. Read the 6th chapter of 2 Kings. They ate their children. A lady walked up to me after I preached on this years ago. She said, I never heard that Israel ate their children. They bore their children according to the lamentations. They were their food in the siege. God says, you're going to treat me wrong, and you not, I'm not going to have any pity on you. I'll make you starving. You say, I wouldn't eat my family. You wouldn't. Well, that Donner family that traveled out 
And then that snowstorm during the 1800s, they started eating, they eating one another. That soccer team down there that crashed in the Andes down in South America, they ate one another. You go without food for a month or two, what will you do? You don't know what you'll do. Israel did. God said, I will make you eat your children. Over what? Christmas. That was all it was about. It was Christmas under another name. It was called Bell in the Grove for 500 years. Most people don't even know that Israel was disobedient to God in the Old Testament. They oppressed the poor. They went after other gods because they didn't want to keep the rules of Jehovah God. They didn't like it. And the reason God scattered them was for celebrating Christmas under another name. The reason the World Trade Center came down was because Israel celebrated Christmas under another name. Good grief. They're over there fighting over that land, and anyone who sides with Israel sides against the Arabs, and they have something called Al-Fatah. And the Al-Fatah is anyone who tries to stop the Arab cause of Muslim you are immediately in jihad with them. Jihad is a holy war. When President Harry Truman pushed in May 14, 1948 for Israel to be a nation, and we signed all of this, and Truman put, he put this, Truman is a hero in Israel because he pushed for their statehood. And when he did that, they became a nation May 14, 1948, and we were in G they were in jihad against us May 15th, 1948. And they've been attacking us and Israel ever since. That's why the World Trade Center came down. It has to do with Christmas. Whether people believe it or not, whether you like it or not, it's the truth. It was Christmas under another name. And God took them out of the land. I've got a paper up here. It's got all the nations that, that ruled Israel. Some of them would rule two years and be overthrown by somebody else. You're welcome to have a copy of it. This is all the, from the time that they were destroyed by Titus, the Roman general in 70 A.D. Shows all the nations that have ruled them. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Talking about Israel. Luke 21, 24. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trodden out of the Gentiles until the Gentile rule is fulfilled. And it has been fulfilled as of these dates in the 1940s and 60s. We're sitting on the end of time. That's what's going on in the Middle East. And preachers don't have any idea what this is about. I've spent my whole life, 61 years studying this. Not my whole life. I'm 78, and I started studying when I was 16 years old, 17 years old in the mid-50s. Preachers are idiots, idiotes, ignorant, unlearned. I don't like them because they take the Word of God that I love and slaughter it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us to continue your work. I will not stop, regardless of the cost. Help us, Lord. Help us to stand for truth, in truth. Help us to crucify this flesh that we're in. And the only way we can do that is to have the conviction of your word. And tell people these truths. We'll praise you for all things. Fight our battles for us. Lead us to your elect. Supply every need that we have in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we kind of got back to Christmas. Hey, David. What are you doing? How's it going? Doing pretty, a lot better than I have been. Can I get a copy of that prayer? Well, yeah. Make a bunch of copies. Take, huh? I don't know, 25, 50. Okay. Uh, just make a bunch of them. There's some paper over there. I'll see you over.
Go Rose. Hey, I'm sorry. Taking it day by day. Take a point.